Welcome to the Financial Advisor Success Podcast, where you go behind the scenes with financial planner, speaker, and consultant Michael Kitsis to hear stories of how leading financial advisors navigated the inevitable challenges that arise on the path to success and get insight from leading industry consultants about how to break through to the next level in your advisory business. And now here's your host, Michael Kitsis. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the 256th episode of the Financial Advisor Success Podcast. My guest on today's podcast is Vincent Barbera. Vince is the founder of Newbridge Wealth Management, an independent RIA based right outside of Philadelphia that oversees nearly 120 million of assets under management for 75 client households. What's unique about Vince, though, is the way he stays on the cutting or sometimes bleeding edge of advisor technology by continuously experimenting with new tech tools for his advisory firm, setting his new strategic focus every year to identify a new category of solutions to try out, either internally with his team or externally with his clients. In this episode, we talk in depth about the new technology tools that Vince has been trying this year with the theme of improving his client experience, including using Nudge to keep track and collaborate with his clients on their financial planning tasks, Pulse 360 to keep his meeting agendas and post-meeting notes more organized, and Hubly to help systematize the firm's workflows above and beyond what his CRM alone can accomplish. We also talk about how Vince manages his technology choices and budget to avoid having the cost spiral upwards out of control by just adding more and more technology. How Vince compares the cost of new technology tools to his financial planning software to determine if it's a reasonable price, because if it costs more than his planning software, he better be using it more than his planning software. How Vince regularly assesses how often he's logging into his technology tools to decide what to prune and get rid of, and where Vince goes to find the latest and greatest tools to try out and the gaps he still can't find a solution for. And be certain to listen to the end, where Vince shares his own journey through the financial services industry, from starting out at a large asset manager's high net worth advice department, but finding the advice was still too focused on the firm's asset management products and not on the rest of his clients' financial advice needs. How Vince made the transition to go out and launch his own independent firm with an eye towards using all the technology tools that are available today to stay competitive without an asset manager's size and scale. And why Vince ultimately decided that he did not want to try to build the next billion dollar firm and has actually felt even happier in his business by consciously deciding to take his foot off the gas and grow a little slower for a while. And so with that introduction, I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Financial Advisor Success Podcast with Vincent Barbera. Welcome, Vincent Barbera, to the Financial Advisor Success Podcast. Thank you, Michael. Happy to be here. I'm really looking forward to today's discussion, and I'm talking a little bit about just evolution of advisory firms, and and just as I view it, the, the amazing things we can do to run firms today with all the technology that's out there, and it just like the, the the constant flow of new technology that's coming out as we you know like to like to track on our advisor tech map mm-hmm. that. I feel like there's all this discussion right now about consolidation in the industry. Like it's happening in technology firms, it's happening in advisor platforms, it's happening in advisory firms themselves. And 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 a lot of folks are pounding the table to say, you know, the the, the small to mid-sized firm can't survive. You need all this size and economies of scale in, in in order to succeed. And, you know, I just reflect back, like I, you know, I started almost 20 years ago, you know, bounced around for a few years and then finally had the good fortune to land in a you know, a well-established, fast-growing advisory firm. And they were a little under $200 million under management. And I, and I think I was team member number nine. Mm-hmm. And I look out today and I see firms that have less, you know, like approaching $200 million that are running with six team members, five team members, four team members. I saw right. one that had three. And, and it's like, well, where did all the other people go? And the answer is, well, yeah, we like, you know, we used to have a bunch of team members that that did all this back office and administrative stuff. And now like we have a bunch of software that we pay $49 a month for that makes all that automatically happen. Mm-hmm. And to me, there's just this strange paradox that a lot of people in the industry are being the table about how it's gonna be so much harder to build and scale advisory firms and and the the need to consolidate. And then when I just actually look at the data and the practice management metrics and, and even just looking out there in the advisor landscape, just we can do so much with tech that used to take people that it seems like the small to mid-sized firm has like never been more efficient and capable than it is today. Cool. And just, I, I know, I know you live a lot of that because you're you're one of those advisors that really likes to experiment and play with all of the new tech. And I think are, are living a little bit of this front edge of just how how lean and efficient you can be with all the technology that's out there today. 
Yeah. And, you know, to take that example, even to apply it to my own situation, it was very similar. We had about 200, 225, and uh, yeah, we had about 11 or 12 employees. And two people were assigned to just doing reconciliation, right? Yes. I mean, that's oh, I mean, the good old days of portfolio center downloads and reconciliation. Uh huh. Yeah. I mean, it was like Avent access. And then, there, but we, and then we had bio accounts. We always had issues with the Raymond James feeds. And there was like, you know, people assigned to, and I remember even printing out Advent access reports and writing the trades that I wanted, you know, sell X amount of this, buy this, and then even giving it to that individual who then punched it into the computer and made the trade. Like, wow. I mean, think about that. That's mind blowing, right? And it's like now, yeah, I can completely leverage tech to eliminate all back off. Sometimes I have guilt, Michael, because I'm not hiring, you know, it's like, you know, and giving somebody a job because I'm utilizing technology, it's taking their job away. <laughs> you know, it's like, should I decrease the amount of tech I use and hire somebody just to sort of, you know, hire somebody and give somebody a job? <laughs> well, I mean, it, it, it's an interesting shift though. And, and even around uh, that point around hiring, so, uh, you know, we, feel like we had this cycle in the 2010s of, you know, oh my gosh, the robo-advisors are here. Are the robo-advisors going to oh, replace yeah. human advisors? And, you know, the robots said yes, and the humans said no, in part because, you know, we're human advisors. Like, what else are we going to say? Yes, I think I'm completely doomed from this robot. I mean, even if you were, you probably wouldn't say that. Right. But, you know, we've gotten to the end of the decade. It was like, we're all still here. Advisor business is still growing. We're, we're, we're powering forward. But, you know, there are a lot of support jobs that just don't seem to be getting hired the way that they used to. That I, I, I think part of even the effect that's coming from technology, you know, there was all this discussion about you know, robots versus human advisors. And the, and the human advisor here is still doing fine. We're, we're just leveraging more technology. But the, the jobs that do seem to be getting shifted are not the advisor jobs. It's, it's all the back office jobs that, right. as you said, right, like you used to be multiple team members doing downloads of reconciliation every single morning. And now it's just, well, I got performance reporting software and I expect them to have the right data because that's what I pay them for. And that's I pay them you know, $40 for an account per year, not tens of thousands of dollars per team member to do this manually every day. That's absolutely correct. Yes, that's absolutely correct. Yeah, I mean, there's actually like an, it, it, but it's, what's been fantastic, it's allowed us to emphasize the advice. And actually the advice I think is probably even better than it was you know, and when that robo thing, I mean, we, we went through the whole thing, you know, we looked at Gemstep, we looked at all those Trizic, we looked at all those potential robos, Robos Wealth, which was local, but it was like, it, you know, it was missing the heartbeat and our relationship is all about heartbeat, right? And, and just the personal relationships that you form with individuals. That's why I always think there's going to be a place for us small guys. You know, I don't think it's going to be the big warehouses. There's always going to be a place because somebody's going to want that personal touch. So I'm struck, though, that just you, you said you know, when they were coming out, you were looking at the players like Gemstep and Trizic and Robust Wealth, which which were not the direct to consumer robos. Well, Gemstep was really early on, but yeah. pivoted to the advisor channels. Like those were not the direct to consumer robos. Those like those were the platforms that were s supporting us as advisors. So in in theory, to free up more of our back office so that we could spend more time with clients and do more new and cool things. So I'm I'm curious, like did did you try some of those? Did you use them? Did you did you buy them? Did you not buy them? Like as a as a tech adopter, mm -hmm. what did what did you do with Robotech for advisors? No, it's a good question. It's because you know I was looking at the betterment and wealth front, and you were you saw the interest, right? And you saw all these individual retail investors loving it, and maybe it was because of the user interface. You know, it was it was it was sexy, right? And it was neat. And it's like okay, maybe there's an opportunity for us to push this out. To capture, like for us, it was all about capturing potentially, because, you know, we're like multi-generational, like a lot of us are, right? And to ensure that we're providing something to the younger generation, let's have something like this that they can at least monitor their investments, get them in a model portfolio that is managed by this robo, what have you. Some people, though, thought, all right, if I just sort of open this up and put it on the website, all of a sudden I'm going to get this huge business development crush, as though there were many millennials coming to the average advisor's website yeah, I mean, in the first place. Yeah, I'm like, come on. You know, that was foolish. No, but we're like, you know, all right, you know, if this is going to be something that sticks around, we at least need to dip our toe into it and be prepared and be ready. So we did talk to a few of them. And as we were talking to them, they were starting to be acquired. Like, you know, Gemstep was acquired by Invesco. And it's like, okay, well, who's left? You know, and Robust Wealth was somebody that actually 
we had a relationship with. We started a relationship. We, the funny thing is, you know, we went so far as to, you know, help create the back office and tie it into our systems and things like that, but we never really pushed it out to our clients. Why not? What happened? I was, honestly, I was never really comfortable with it. I didn't quite have the user interface that I particularly wanted. I didn't think it was, you know, strong enough. And there was, and I, I, even surveyed the clients that we did have. And I'm like, is this something that's of interest? Nobody really cared. And I'm like, the work that would be involved in pushing this out and the cost potentially, at the end of the day, just really wasn't worth it to us. And then I so, love the guys at Robust Wealth though, man. You know, they were really cool. They were doing cool stuff. And then like a year or two later, they were acquired by principal. Right. And it's like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not interested. And that sort of, our interest then died when it came to, you know, the digital, the digital solutions. So, so why was it that, why was it that even talking to clients, they, like you said, they, they were lukewarm or I'm not even sure lukewarm. Like I think you said, they, they, you surveyed them. They just didn't care. Yeah. I mean, just the, in theory, the whole point of this was supposed to be like, here's the next generation of client experience. And then you surveyed your clients and they're like, nah. Yeah. So well, what, like, what's the gap? Yeah. So what I do every time when I'm trying to introduce a new tech that the clients are going to be touching, you know, obviously there's some tech that are purely back office, but others that sort of cross that. And I had them go through it. And the feedback was, okay, this is cool, but you know, what, what am I getting out of this? You know, what, what is, the, why is this different than something else? Even if you sign my son up, you know, and put him in a model portfolio, why can't he just log into TD or Schwab? Why is this necessary? You know, because it does some automatically balancing. So from that perspective, they just didn't really see anything. I'm like, well, if you're not going to adopt it, if you're not going to, you know, if this isn't going to be something that interests you, then why should I spend the money? You know, give them 20 basis points, you know, for <laughs> every account or what have you. And then it was like, you know, we had some discussion where, well, maybe it'll attract other people, like back to my earlier point. And I'm like, well, then you got to spend a good amount of money on marketing to drive traffic to the website to potentially take advantage of something like this. At the end right, of the day, it's, it's not just the event. like, you know, put put the, you know, put the button for millennials between the lighthouse and the Adirondack chairs and hope that they click on it when they come to your website. Exactly. And the other thing too, though, Michael, is like, so what they were selling is all these efficiencies when it comes to portfolio management, right? It's like, oh, we'll do it all, rebound. And honest with you, when we sort of broke it out and looked at the time, well, number one, we absolutely love doing that stuff. So we weren't really ready to assign it to a, to a machine. But then we we're using iRebound. You know, we had things in place that allowed us to get these things done pretty efficiently and pretty cleanly, even for these, what I call young savers. So again, at the end of the day, it just really wasn't worth it. And then they were, and sort of the, the money that they were taking off of the top, even for like, you know, a betterment for advisors, it's just, it wasn't worth the cost. It wasn't worth the cost for what, what functionally was a tech solution. Correct. Right. It's one thing we, I think it's always the classic split in our industry. Like we, we pay basis points for asset management, but we pay, you know, monthly or annual fees for tech to the point where it's usually, it's, it's, it's pretty easy to tell which platforms are actually software companies in which are really in the asset management business because asset managers charge basis points and software companies charge charge user fees. I, I think it's the dream of every software company to manage to charge basis points. It's, so. a, right. it's, a, it's a pretty <laughs> lucrative business as many of us live in the business ourselves. There's a lot of nice things about how you scale it. But there is just that divide that, you know, if you're charging me basis points, it's usually because I'm it's usually for asset management. If I didn't actually want to outsource the asset management and it's just the tech, you know, as you said, like I sort of the collective feeling I got from the whole advisor community when when all of these sort of B2B robos came out was like, wow, this is awesome tech. I so want my custodian to do this as part of what they do, where I don't have to pay for it because my custodian already does it and they've already got my money. Right. There was the whole like, right. yes, I want this, but no, I don't want to buy a separate layer to make my custodian better. I just want my custodian to be better. Right, right, right. That's and right. have, you know, the account opening wizards and the better user experience and the website stuff and the trading tools and all the rest so that I don't need to pay for separate software. I just expect my my custodian upgrade, which yeah, by and large, I think they they have eventually managed to do some a little bit more than others. But we are a lot further along than that than we were eight or nine years ago when robo-advisors were, were first showing up on the scene. And, and I think a lot of that was spurred by Robo advisors showing up in a lot of existing firms, both both advisor platforms and and direct to consumer, saying like, "Oh yeah, I guess this is embarrassing." Like we were all comparing to each other, 
and thought we had pretty decent tech. And then a robo advisor comes along. It's like, oh, we're really all not very good. At no, I know that was that was very. I remember looking at personal <laughs> capital, and now you know that's a little bit different what they choke. But I was like, wow, that is good looking. Like, like I'm not being replaced by that, but I actually would like that. Like, <laughs> yeah. that would be lovely. I know. I remember getting so mad at TD Institutional because remember, you know, Schwab came out with the intelligent portfolios, right? Now they're in a little bit of hot water. But TD, you know, they had something on the retail side. Remember that? But they didn't make it available to us on the institutional side. Yeah. And it was like, what? Why? Come on. That always frustrated me about that. But yeah, the uh, that kind of just that kind of just died away. And then yeah, a lot of these mutual fund companies bought it for distribution. Yep. It's just amazing how things change. And it's like, and that's the one thing when it comes to technology is you just have to be careful not to fall in love. Like I look at it as, you know, when you're buying your primary residence, you know, you want to feel warm and fuzzy, you know, and it's like, it's going to be your home. You're going to raise a family in. It's got to mean something to you, right? Just got to be this, this connection. But when you're buying investment property, you have to avoid any emotional attachment. I mean, you have to just look at it as an asset that you're purchasing this and that. And I look at mm. the same thing with technology. It just, you can't get emotionally involved with technology. You just, you, you can't because they could disappear in a heartbeat. You know, you just sort of have to, have to somewhat say, stay detached. But I just, how do you do that in, in, mm. in practice in a world where just, as we said, like you, you got a lot of efficiency and scalability out of the technology, but the flip side is like, it's because you actually ingrain it into your processes, which right. means it's really a pain and disruptive when one of them goes away. You're absolutely right about that. And that's where, so it's funny, I have like a whiteboard up and I have all these sort of defined process, all right, you know, with the client experience. So it's, you know, I'm just really trying to create the client experience. And, you know, I have to make note of which technologies are involved and in what part of the client experience process, right? And it's almost like, all right, well, what would that process look like if that particular text were to go, tech were going to go bye-bye? You know, I need to have something that can sort of step in and replace that. Same thing with the back office. Like, so a big thing to sort of jump ahead a little bit, but a big thing we implemented this year was a tech called Hubly. Are you familiar? Yep. Yeah. So Hubly is fantastic. You know, we've been using Redtail really since the advent, since the beginning of Newbridge. Well, I lie. We actually used Salesforce first because it was offered by TD. Okay. Uh, but it was a little too big. So we moved to Redtail. We've been using Redtail ever since, but I've never been in love with their workflows. You know, I just haven't liked them. It hasn't worked for me. And then Hubble came around. What is it about the Redtail workflows that don't work for you? So just, I know they've, they've been trying to put more into it, make them more effective. It's all the CRM companies have over the past couple of years, workflows has become a big focus. So what wasn't working for you that, that made you say, I got to find something else? First of all, it, was like, it, was, it seemed to be overly complex building anything took so long and I found to be so regimented. It was almost like I was looking more like an you know, asana, something like a task flow type that wasn't connected to the calendar, but that was just, it was just smooth and it was much easier to get done. Whenever I went into a red tail workflow, it just seemed to be overly complex. All right, well, I have to assign this 15 days before this particular task, but, but it's not always 15 days. It wasn't as nimble as I needed it to be. And with the Hubly, it's a lot more nimble. It just allows me to sort of, all right, I got to change this workflow on the fly because it might be a little bit different for this particular subset of clients, all right? So for, for those aren't, who aren't familiar, just can you explain a little bit more about what Hubly is and, and what it does and how it works? Yeah, sure. Hubly is almost like it sits on top of like a Redtail or Wealthbox or the two CRMs that are work. So it, it pulls in a lot of the client data, right? And then it has its own, what they call a hub, of all these different workflows. So for example, let's talk about an onboarding process. So you have this onboarding process with all these tasks assigned to that particular process, right? And you can assign it to individual people within the firm and things like that. And then they, they get a notification that something has been assigned to them. And then once you're done one workflow, it can automatically feed into another workflow, right? So it kind of just, it, it works in unison. What, what's really great about it is like an annual service calendar. So it's like, okay, this is what I need to do in first quarter. So I built all these particular, let's say, for example, you know, it's an insurance review, right? So insurance for you for these particular clients, and it's, it's built into Hubly based on that timing. And then once that's done, it feeds into another workflow, which is going to notify me at the end of next quarter that this has got to be done. So it's very proactive. But yeah, but it's basically just a workflow system that sits, you know, in, in a way sits on top of the uh, Redtail CRM to the point where you hope it almost replaces it 
where you're not having to, to dial into Redtail at all. Because I still use the Redtail calendar, but that's pretty much it. Everything else I sort of manage in Hubbly. It's like just this workflow what, database. It's awesome. What about just all the like client notes and activity capture and the rest? Is that is it's that all, at the Redtail level as well, or is that also at Hubbly level? I capture it all at Hubbly. So I put my meeting notes in Hubbly, which then feeds directly into Redtail. So at least it's captured in Redtail. So yeah, I do everything, all my meeting notes, all my prep, things like that in the Hubbly system. Interesting. Interesting. And again, the the reason you don't build all this in in Redtail is just you just like you find it easier to build yes. it in Hubbly, just from a interface UI perspective. Like it's just easier to build these. Cause what you're describing are like a lot of workflows and some not simple ones. So I'm I'm sure there are folks out there that are envisioning this and like, yeah, that sounds really awful to spend all that time building. But you're fine with that because the whole point is like it makes it easier that that's actually not such a big deal. Exactly. And the, and the huge thing, too, is when we first signed on with Hubbly, they really worked with us in creating the workflows. Hmm. So they did, did a deep dive. It's like, all right, what's your firm? What's your process? What's all this stuff? I even shared with them some of the incomplete workflows I had created in Redtail. I even had my virtual assistant, Michelle Wong, going into it. And uh, it's like, all right, this is sort of like, this is what we need to build. And they took it and they ran with it. And then they have other, so many other templates. It's like best of breed type. You know, they have so many other templates that other RIAs use that you can then borrow and sort of work that into your own workflow. And it's so much easier. You know, it's got all these nice little colors in it, but it's just, um, you actually have have some fun in it, building the workflows. And so I have to admit that that might be a thing where you you have fun with it that's but all. <laughs> Yeah, but I'll, I'll totally take your word for it. Yeah. Well, if you get in there and look at it, look at all the pretty colors, it's uh, it's nice. <laughs> well, I, I do I do like pretty colors and like check boxes that check off and feel oh. good at the end of my day for all the things that got done. So. Yeah, see, see, and I mean it's a Canadian company and I'm partial to Canada, so that helps. That helps. So how do you like? How do you find tools like this in the first place? Right, I. I I granted, like Hubley's one we followed for a little while, just through through Kitsis.com. I think certainly is not a not a mainstream company yet, as that as it were in the advisor space. They're 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 still a little little newer and under the radar screen. So, how do you find tools like Hubly to be into this in the first place? Yeah, it's a good question. A couple of ways. Number one, I mean, your tech map helps. So sometimes when I need to fill in, like say for example, you know, I expect to have a significant amount of retirement income planning on the horizon. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And I use eMoney for my financial planning software. And if I know eMoney is not going to be able to help me get it done, you know, it's like, all right, I'll bring out your map. It's like, okay, what are sort of the retirement income softwares? That might be my first step. The other thing is, you know, I try to make a point to even go to T3. Am I, I mean, this was a little bit, a little, some time ago, kind of like pre COVID, unfortunately, but it's like the first step is the emerging tech. You know how they have an entire area for emerging tech? Yep. Yeah. So it's like, let me go there first. What is up and coming? And then you kind of just, it, it sort of like goes from there. You know, you try to say, all right, what's what's the new and up and coming? You know, talking to colleagues, things like that. And uh, like, oh, you got to check this out. You know, they're new. They're looking for beta testers. I'm like, sign me up. I beta tested, I don't know, 15, 20 different techs. You know, it's like. Okay. So when, when, when people say they're looking for beta testers, you like, you're one of those people that, that, that raises their hands. Like, oh, yeah, I, no. I have I'm, a whole, I'm so in on that. Yeah. I have a whole CV specifically giving my, my, my bona fides as to why I'm a great beta tester. Oh, wow. All right. So <laughs> I didn't realize it was, it had become that competitive an environment. Like you oh gotta, my gosh, yes. you gotta, you gotta win the application process to be an awesome beta tester. Okay. Oh yeah. Yeah. You got, you're, get you're all in on that. I'm all in on that. It's like 10 years of experience being a beta tester. It's like just to get access to that at like low cost and things like that. It's just like, all right, let's see it. So yeah, so, it's exciting, but it's really just a lot of just sort of searching around. So what's on, what's on your radar screen be, besides tools like Hubly? Like what, what else are you? Are you using or testing or or eyeing and going to be testing? Well, it's interesting. So every year I'll go over my own tech roadmap, right? So it's like, what tech did I use last year that I'm not using this year? What do I want to improve on this year from a business perspective? So for example, this year, I really wanted to improve on sort of the client experience. And that client experience even included outputs, you know? So what tech can I use to improve my overall client experience? Last year is about investment management, right? What can I do? What kind of tech is out there to help improve 
you know, the conversations around investment management. This year, it's all about client experience. So, for example, that's where Hubly came about, right? So it allows me to improve my client experience because it allows me to be proactive with clients, get in touch with them. I mean, the other thing that I, I brought on was like Pulse 360 and Nudge, right? Again, specifically about the client experience. Nudge allows me to communicate with the clients with uh, task reminders, right? So as part of the client experience, another thing with like Pulse 360, it allows me to be a little bit more organized when it comes to delivering agendas to clients, but it's a consistent agenda. It looks the same every time as well as a meeting summary after the fact. So that's how I'm able to sort of focus on the tech. It's like, okay, what do I want to accomplish this year? And what tech out there would allow me to do that? So wait, can you, can you take us a little bit further on these? Because again, I suspect these are tools that that not a lot of other advisors know. So talk a little bit more about Pulse 360 and like what, what, what they do and what you're doing with them. Yeah, so Pulse 360, it's also about task management. So what you do is you could create, it integrates with like Redtail and Wealthbox, same thing, right? But you can create meeting agendas for client meetings that are almost sent out automatically. And then after the meeting is done, there's a lot of pre-built templates and things along those lines. But also you sort of create, all right, you feed in the information. This is what we discussed. Boom, 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 boom. It's a nice letter that gets sent out to the client after the meeting. Like in so the like pad, a pre-built templated yeah. post-meeting follow-up letter. So it like the template's there. You just literally have to drop in the things we discussed, and then I can I can hit send and save a couple of minutes on my on my email follow-up. That's right. And it looks more professional. It's more of a it's more consistent. Like so in the past, you know, it would, I would send out an email summary or, you know, maybe a text message, something like that, but it just wasn't a consistent approach. So talk about building efficiencies in the practice. This is a consistent approach that happens automatically on time, every client meeting, boom, 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 boom. And the client receives receives that. So it saves me time I having to send an email. Because honestly, Michael, you know. My worst problem is like when a client meeting is over, it's recording the notes for that meeting. Like right. sometimes it'll be two, three weeks later, and I still have the red tail entry in my calendar, but I haven't completed it and put in any meeting notes. And that's that's horrible, right? Because I have to sort of use that information to then plan for the next meeting. So right. this allows me to sort of just get that done a little bit quicker. So I guess both meeting prep, so like pre- prepping meeting agendas, and then the the post meeting capture and follow up of more templates just means you have to type less and capture less, which means you can get it done in less time. So, a you save time, and b like maybe maybe we get around to doing it a little bit faster because it's not quite so painful since we can do it quickly. And it makes it easier too when I have to sort of look back to say, all right, all right, we have a meeting coming up. What did we discuss last time? What needs to get? All the information is organized, right? And it's very very clean. And again, it saves me it saves me time. And that's the name of the game, right? And then what is Nudge? So Nudge with a K is, uh, so it's interesting. It's only been around out maybe a year and a half, maybe, maybe two. But what Nudge is, is so specifically about the action items. So you have a meeting with a client, right? And you always have homework. You are always assigning homework to the client. So what the Nudge does, it nudges them to say, okay, you know, need your social security statement. Or don't forget to send me a copy of your power of attorney. And that nudge, that little message gets delivered to them via email, via text message, something like that. It's ongoing reminders. Because a lot of times, especially when we're working with, you know, my clients are, most of them are between the ages of like 45 and 55. So not only, you know, are their lives being dominated by kids' activities, but their work, everything else. So it's just very difficult for them to keep track of everything. So what the nudge is, here's a friendly reminder being delivered via, you know, the preferred method of communication to say, all right, you got to get that stuff to me. Or you're about to max out on social security, right? Your paycheck's going to be a little bit bigger. Why don't we save some additional dollars into a taxable account at this point in time? Or it's like, make sure, you know, you send your 1040 to your accountant and you send that out, you know, February 15th or something like that. So again, it's just these ongoing reminders that clients receive that again, enhances the client experience. I'm struck here as well that as you're describing like Pulse 360 for meeting prep and 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 meeting follow up, nudge further follow up. I, I guess I feel like there's a little bit of duplication there, but uh, there is, there is, of just the follow up y stuff. Yeah. Like what what do you put in Pulse for meeting follow up, and what do you put in Nudge for follow up for clients? 
Yeah. So yeah, it's like, for example, like the Pulse 360 is more sort of the overview. The the nudge is just specific, you know, reminders that you want to send to clients all about nudging them. It's always about just the reminders. Pulse 360 can't really, can't do that. They'll just send, you know, the meeting summaries and things like that. But like I said earlier, when I do my audit in January, to your point, Michael, I may find sort of going through and you know what? There might be too much duplication here, or maybe I can do this a little bit differently, a little bit better to let me lose one of these texts. I am struck though, that just, well, so two things, one, like, like all of the things you're talking about for client experience or kind of hubbly and pulse and nudge are, are all actually, you just, the industry tends to talk about client experience as you basically like beautiful portals for clients to log into is usually what it comes down to like a, yeah. a beautiful thing clients can log into. And like, these are very tasky workflowy mm -hmm. for you, like literal client workflows to be more proactive and meeting prep templates and meeting follow-up templates and templates to nudge clients that, that like it's, this I'm sure it's, it's very tasky oriented as opposed to, beautiful portals as a way to think about client experience. Well, it's interesting. So yeah, I do. I think of client experience in two ways. Number one, so, so we use, like I said, we use eMoney, right? And we use the portal of eMoney. So that's sort of, if you will, the hub. But I would say 10% of the client base logs into the eMoney portal on a regular basis, right? So for me too, it's, it's with new clients, I want to ensure that the experience that they have with onboarding and getting the information that they need is seamless. And I do you know, try to leverage e-money in the beginning of the relationship to do that. But as for ongoing work, to me, part of the client experience is that the planning items are communicating with clients. They're receiving consistent messages. They know it's like, all right, it's the third week at the end of the quarter. I know I'm meeting with Vince. So everything is just, is just a very consistent approach. And that's where I need these things to, to be able to deliver that consistency. So that's where I see sort of the client experience as well. I mean, also with the client experience, you know, is, you know, the things that they do receive, the outputs, right? And that's important. But I think sort of the way that we communicate, the ongoing proactive communication is very important to that experience. So they just know when, what they're getting, when they're getting it. It's not just always about the, the shiny portal that looks great. You know, that's part of it. But again, it, the adoption isn't there to spend tens and tens and tens of thousands of dollars on doing that. More right. important to the client is to be able to be proactive and deliver service, you know, quickly and efficiently that they just need to get done what they get, what they need to get done. Most of the compliments and the thank yous I receive from clients is like, thank you for holding me accountable. Thank you for ensuring that I get done this stuff, you know, be it finalizing the state mm -hmm. documents that to them is very valuable than logging in and seeing a, you know, sexy e-money portal. Yeah. Well, cause I'd great. If I think about it at a high level, like, as you'd mentioned earlier, you just clients are most appreciative when they can actually reflect on just like, it weighs their lives have actually gotten better. Like I've, I've worked with you and I'm in a better place. We are, our house is in better financial order. We've made changes we need to make. Like we did things. You rarely hear a client's like, I am, I am so thankful that I'm paying you all these thousands of dollars every year, because let me tell you, when I log into your website, mm, <laughs> right. right? Like it's just not, nobody has that conversation, right? It's, it's, wow, you know, we've been needing to do that stuff for a long time and we worked with you and we finally got it done and it turned out to really matter because this thing happened not long thereafter and I'm so thankful that we work with you and you helped us get our house in order before the bad thing happened that we were totally now prepared to deal with because of the work we'd done with you. That's what creates the moments. It's not It's not the beautiful login. I mean, it, I think at the end of the day, if they want a beautiful login, they can get a really cool tech platform that does that without us. Like usually at the point they're they're hiring an advisor to, to delegate or to work with, like the... The whole point is I need someone to help me get this stuff done. Because if I was actually really good at doing it myself through technology, I literally wouldn't have hired you. I just would have done it on the internet myself with technology. And you're absolutely right about that, Michael. And sometimes they've tried that. You know, a lot of, most of the individuals that come to us have never worked with an advisor before, right? They tried to do it themselves. They tried to use one of those online tools. And after two, three weeks, the novelty wears off, you know, the user interface becomes less important. And they're like... I'm no better off now than I was three weeks ago. It's like, I need to hire somebody to hold my butt to the fire, to hold me accountable, to ensure that I get this done. I work with one couple and the husband is, 
he's sort of the family CFO, right? He's in charge of everything. He just sort of dominates those conversations and dominates all the tasks. But the wife, she is the one who communicates with me more. And she's like, he's not getting it done. He's not getting this stuff <laughs> done. I'm like, so then I have to call him and I'm like, okay, it's time to be, you know, forgive my French here, but it's time to be Vince. This is what you need to get done. And this is what you, you got to get it done by this. Otherwise, we're going to have a situation on our hands and I'd rather not have to be a marriage counselor. Do me a favor and get it done. And they're like, you're right, you're right, you're right. I'm making a priority. I mean, that's a lot of what we do do is like is coaching and holding holding our clients accountable to make sure, you know, things things get done when they need to get done because time is of the essence. What about all the Roth conversions that, you know, we were doing in March, April of last year? You know, it was just like in some clients where you're not directly managing those assets, if they're elsewhere, say they're at Vanguard. I mean, there were a couple of situations where I'm like, this is a perfect opportunity maybe to do some Roth conversion. And guess what? They didn't do it. So next thing you know, they're coming to me at, you know, October, December, and it's like, ah, well, I'll still get it done, but it would have been a lot better if you did it when I asked you to. The other thing I'm struck by on this is, is just you're using Hubly for the workflows to kind of overlay your CRM. Mm -hmm. You're using Pulse 360 for the meeting prep and the meeting follow-up that overlays the CRM. You're using Nudge to do all the task follow-up, you know, directly to the client's instead of through the CRM, like just all of these are basically like overlays to your CRM, different ways to add things to your CRM sure. beyond the CRM, which I, I guess just even akin to the earlier robo discussion, like, do you see these as long-term solutions or do you see these as like, this is what I'm using until eventually the CRM systems, I'll do this themselves and then I'll just use my CRM again? Well, it's a good question. Yes. I mean, really... I use the Red Tail CRM as almost just a collection of data and compliance. You know what I mean? And again, the calendar. Mm -hmm. But yes, I mean, if all of a sudden Red Tail would have come out with something that would be very similar to something like this, like even like a Pulse or a Hubbly or something along the note, yes, there may be a business case that I would just then keep it with Red Tail. Because I'm assuming like every app these days, it seems is pretty much $49 a month, give or take a little. So I'm assuming like you're paying that, you're paying that for each of these so like you're paying significantly more for the the add-ons beyond red tail than you actually pay for red tail that's absolutely correct that's absolutely correct and some of these are a lot more you know they're more than the 49 but then that's where this tech audit becomes so important to keep try to keep these expenses in check because like i said i could spend all the money in the world you know right. on this on these tech solutions but no you're absolutely right but for me to this sort of deliver you know, what I want to deliver, sometimes I have to use technology that would be hoping that the red tail would take care of or, or the CRMs would take care of. But no, you're right. Until the, until the CRMs are able to deliver this, but I see the CRMs too, is just like a Rolodex. You know, they just, they hold the client data, the addresses, all that information, some archiving, but I don't necessarily look to the CRM in, in delivering these services now or in the future. I'd be surprised if they sort of bring this in-house. But it's like, all right, these are the things that I need to get better at that I want to be able to do with my clients. Is there something out there that I can use or am I simply going back to Excel and, and Word docs and managing these things? And luckily, I don't have to. And so as you just buy all these different tools, and I guess particularly since it sounds like you you experiment with them and see how they go. And at the end of the year, you you do kind of the postmortem and the updated roadmap to say, am, am I keeping this? Am I not keeping it? Am I going to keep one of the three, but not all three or, or wherever it comes out? I'm presuming that at some point, just you have to start making the 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 budgetary and financial decisions of just, is is this tool worth it at the end of the day? And, and how much should all my tools add up to at the end of the day? <laughs> right. So I just, how do you think about, how do you think about technology budget? Like, how do you decide what's a reasonable expense, either for any particular piece of software when you get, you know, as noted stuff that can go anywhere from $20 a month to $100 a month or more. And you've got a whole bunch of these different tools that can quickly add up. So how do you evaluate ROI of tech software? Yeah, that's a good question. So right now I'm spending probably about 10% of my revenue on tech. Now, a big part of that is Orion and e-money and things along those lines, right? But what I do do to sort of determine sort of the return on investment is, so when I was going through the process last year, it was, the focus last year was investment management, right? So looking at, for example, Quanti, 
risk allies, hidden levers, all that good stuff, right? And they tend to be a little bit more expensive than these other things that we're discussing, right? Yep. The post 360s and the nudges of the world, and which makes sense. I mean, the computing power necessary is, is, is more. But it's like, okay, well, on a month to month basis, you know, how often am I logging in? How often am I using this? On, on a client experience, you know, if I provide this, let's use hidden levers, for example. If I'm providing this hidden lever proposal to a client, number one, is it allowing me to win additional business? Is it improving the communication that I have with clients? And I, when a client comes on board, one thing I'll ask is, you know, how tech savvy are you? And if they say tech, would you want to be part of, of the, you know, of Newbridge Beta? where you can try out some of this tech, especially like that. So, so you so, actually offer that to clients. Oh, yeah. To say, like, do you, you know, we're a tech forward firm that tries things. Do you want to be one of the clients that tries the things with us? Yes, absolutely. It's almost like those, um, you know, the old meetings you would have with with clients and you would discuss sort of the investments in the process and sort of, you know, how things are moving forward with your investment process. But same thing. It's like, all right, this is what we're looking to do. Do you see any value out of this, you know, or how would you like for this information to be delivered differently to you? So their feedback is essential to part, especially, you know, the expensive stuff. And if, if it's not that valuable, because the one thing that I've realized over the last few years is, especially with myself, like since I can so easily fall in love, both with tech, you know, and everything really, I'm just, but the, yeah, my heart got broken a lot of growing up, by the way, it's like, okay, I can love something. Right. But if the client doesn't like it and they're not getting the value of it, what's the point of using it? Because it's so easy for us to, to love these things. Oh my God, it's going to improve. I'm going to be able to deliver this kind of communication, or I'm going to be able to visualize my, the advice that I provide this way. But if a client shrugs their shoulders and they see no value of it, I mean, I'm, I'm not well, going to, I'm not going to use it. That's your world of, we tested all these robo portals and they look beautiful and they look sharp and it seems like it's a quote unquote great client experience. But then we asked our clients and they're like, yeah, I don't, I don't really care. I just want to log into Schwab and TDA or work with you directly. This is doing nothing for me. Well, that's exactly correct. I mean, the one thing that has come up recently that I've spent a good amount of time thinking about is like the one page financial plan, right? Mm -hmm. Now I don't necessarily go with the one page, but it's like, they want to at least be able to say, all right, where am I? How am I tracking? Am I going to be all right? Right. And they basically want that snapshot provided to them. There's no real good tech out there that necessarily provides that, that snapshot, but that's really what they want. They, you know, obviously they don't want all these pages for reports. They don't want all this jazz. They just sort of want the high level. Now, if my client base, again, and it's also about your client base, right? So my client base, like I said, 45 to 55. Maybe, you know, the individuals that I work with, which this is a little bit, they, they do want to see sometimes a little bit more, like individuals who are retired. You know, they want to see some more outputs. They want to see some more graph, this and that. The other, you know, the majority of our, of our clientele, they're just like, all right, I just want to ensure that I'm going to be on track, that I'm doing what I need to do, that I'm not paying too much in taxes, and that my family's protected. And so delivering that to them, it's all about sort of high-level snapshot, right? But if I worked with a group of engineers and they wanted to dial into the weeds, well, maybe I would provide them more cash flow reports for me money. Versus just the five year, you know, maybe they want that. So it's also about sort of who you're working with, which, which helps determine the technologies that we use. For example, we didn't put much more, much emphasis on retirement income planning, right? Because the majority of our clients weren't mm -hmm. quite there yet. That changed a little bit last year. So it's like, okay, we need something that might be able to help us deliver better advice. So what technologies are out there that help us deliver that? I went through a bunch. And I landed on Income Solver. That sure. allows me to deliver, and it sort of coincides with sort of our advice metric, if you will, to deliver something like that. So it's it's a moving target. But then if I evaluate it in January of next year, and I look at Income Solver, how often did I use it, right? What was the benefit to the client? Did they get something out of it? Did it help enhance the advice that I provide? And if the answer is to yes, well, then I'll continue using it. How often do you kill or remove tech? Like how I guess I'm just like, how, yeah. how many I guess we're running both ends. Like how many things do you try and and how many actually survive and how many end out on the cutting room floor at the yeah, end of the a, day? It's a great question. I might use 20%. Like so one thing I was really excited about was cash flow, right? So it's like 
I went to enhance cash flow, you know, really take a deep so look at it. So I use something called cash flow mapping software out there. And good stuff. I love the people behind it. The support was incredible. It was a really good tech. But after like six months of using it, I wasn't using it. I wasn't utilizing it, right? And it was costing me about 130 bucks a month. So that was something that I'm like, I need to chop that. Even though me as an advisor, I like it. I like what it's providing. I think it's cool. It just wasn't doing at the, at the you know, it wasn't satisfying the end user, you know, and I wasn't so what, utilizing it the way because- the What was it I, doing? Like just for folks that aren't familiar, what does it do? What's the software? Yeah. So basically what it says is it's sort of, it looks at the income that you're bringing and it really takes a deep look at your paycheck. It's like, all right, how much is going to taxes? How much go, is going to insurance? Then it looks at your expenses. Because you, you punch it's all this in, in or your client punches all this in, or is this like a account aggregation automatically- sorts out your cash flow. It's punching in. Either you do it or the client does it. So okay. I would just ask for a copy of a current paycheck and plug that information in there. And then you also get sort of their expenses, right? And then you plug that in. And the point of it is saying, all right, you know, this is it. These are, you know, these are the, uh, the income. These are the expenses. This is how much you might have in excess. And they do it with a little bit more spin and a little bit more enhancement. But I'm like, I'm not using it enough because I can kind of do that a lot of times you know, using Excel, which might be a little bit quicker. Okay. Things along those lines. But that's something that, boom. I chop. The one thing that I've I, that I always want to chop is portfolio management software costs. Mm -hmm. You know, I would love to be able to shave that. Like we use Orion, we spend a good amount of money on Orion. The one thing that I do like, like oh, the other thing too, though, Michael, is when I go through that tech audit in January of every year, I reach out, and the tech companies are going to start to hate me if they haven't already, because I'm like, what's your roadmap? I need to know. I need to see your 12 month roadmap. So then I have an understanding of, all right, what enhancements are coming down the line that might be worth it, especially with, with companies that I might slice. Well, if their roadmap for the next 12 months is going to be that strong and it's going to make a difference to my practice, well, maybe I'll keep them around. But it's always about sort of like, what is that roadmap? What enhancements are you making to the, to the software? Like Right Capital right now has intrigued me because of their new income, their new retirement income thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's like, anytime I hear something like this, like, oh, looks like I'm going to have to try out something new. Like the other thing is Y charts, like Y charts, they were at the top of the list last year, but then due to the cost and the fact that I don't know if I necessarily would be dialing into that software every single day, I didn't buy it, but they're persistent salespeople. I'll tell you that. So, so, so what was it? What was it that drew you to Y charts? And then what was it that's not not doing it for you with Y charts. Yeah, well, Y charts, it is a very robust investment, you know, research due diligence type platform. You can do all types of cool stuff when you want to analyze past performance, when you want to analyze even on a macro level. Like it, it, the user interface is really good. It's got that Excel download, and I love Excel. So it's got a lot of great things. That model where you sort of plug into your model and you can do a lot of analysis on on the model, it, it's really unique. But the price point, I'm like, I would have to use this more than I'm even using my financial planning software, really, for it to be worth it, unless I'm able to really, you know, score new clients with it. And I don't necessarily think that so, at the end so of the day, you, it just wasn't. So you kind of think in, in those terms, like I, I, you know, uh, I use my, you know, I use, yeah, I use e-money a certain amount of time. It costs me my 300 something dollars a month. So if you're going to cost more than my financial planning software, I better either use you more than my financial planning software or you better bring me revenue to make up the fact that you cost more than my financial planning software. That's right. Otherwise, you know what it just becomes? It just becomes your own personal sandbox and you're just having fun in it. That's not fair when you're trying to run a business. I mean, that it, so it strikes me just in that, in that context that, you know, if, if, if planning software is sort of your, like the, the benchmark, <laughs> the benchmark comparison point on this, that, the challenge with the pretty much everything in the investment world, right? Whether it's the portfolio management tools like Orion or the investment research tools like Y charts, all that stuff, that whole category is more expensive than planning software. Yes, it is. Just kind of across the across the board. So I, I guess that that's sort of what connects back to your earlier comment of you you really want to cut portfolio management costs like Orion in particular because you're spending more time in the planning software than you are in the investment software, but the investment software is charging you more than the planning software. Yeah, absolutely. And that's where I, like altruist becomes interesting to me, right? Mm -hmm. Because obviously, you know, as you do too, we lead with financial planning. I mean, yep. investments are important, but most of our discussions are around, are around financial planning. 
So I, that's where I need to be able to sort of spend the money. And most times when I am looking at tech, it's around, it's around sort of more of the financial planning or additional elements that I can add, uh, like life field. Maybe I've used that in the past, you know, certain things like that. Well, and that's again, why, when you said you're going after a better client experience, it was not a better portal for clients to log in to see their investment accounts. It was Hubbly, Pulse, Nudge, which are all like financial planning, tasky, you know, tracking, follow up, nudging. Like that, that, that's yeah. the center of that is client service calendar. Like those, those are all tools you're buying for planning tasks, not, not, not investment stuff. That's absolutely correct. That's absolutely correct. And the other, the other benefit to a lot of that stuff too is just it, it, it does allow you additional touches. So you are touching your client much more often. And sometimes too, like, have you ever run into a situation where you all have a client say, oh, I didn't know you did that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like maybe when, you know, cause I, I, I always want to be part of the process during open enrollment. Right. So I always want to be part of that process. And that's even part of one of the nudges I use, uh, open enrollment time, you know, let's set up a call to sort of discuss your options for this year. You know, certain things like that, you know, does an HSA make more sense at this point than, you know, your typical PPO HMO plan. Right. And they're like, oh, you do that? Of course I do that. So having these things, yeah, sort of like also almost enhances, you know, what you do do. So that's great. I mean, the other thing too that, you know, I've, I've spent some time on is like on the marketing side. So one thing I wish I could do more, Michael, to be honest with you, is, is write. I don't hate it, but I wish I could spend the time in creating more original content. But one thing, you know, it's like, all right, these other curated content platforms, like I lost, I looked at Vesterly. That was probably the worst expense I've ever had. In terms of what, what you spent and not feeling like you got the ROI. Yeah, totally. So what, what was the, what was the gap on Vesterly? Yeah, it was just, it was curated content. I wasn't pushing it out. I felt, I, I didn't feel as though there was any value. I almost had the feeling that it could have been potentially negative value because clients just getting these articles that they could get anywhere else. I just didn't feel like, I don't know. It just, it just, it's, it didn't seem like there was much heart to it. Like one thing I like right now is like uh, the seven marketing platform, their content is pretty cool. It's a little bit more topical. It's written a little bit more conversational. So that's, that's not bad. I do enjoy that, but there's been, you know, that's it. There's such a push on content. It's like, all right, even with like Orion, Orion, E-Money does it. They all do it. Right. And it's kind of all the same thing, isn't it? Yeah, well, I, I I think that always becomes the challenge. These things just start blending together. Everybody does everything and does everything else. And if they don't do it yet, they're offering it soon, right? Just there's this whole phenomenon that I feel like a, a lot of the big players want to become quote unquote platforms, which means you know, they, they do everything on their platform. So you don't need to go anywhere else, except in practice, often we are somewhere else, which means we just end out with redundant features, which gets kind of annoying and aggravating because it feels like you're paying for it twice. They don't really necessarily want to switch because... The people that only do that thing are often better than the people who just add that on as the 47th feature on everything else. And yeah, maybe we seem like we kind of get squeezed at that point. Yeah. And sort of like even with Orion adding that feature. I mean, one thing that interests me, and I wouldn't mind getting your take on it, is I remember when, you know, first start Newbridge and this and that, and it was, it was important to get best of breed. So it's like, okay, what is the best financial planning, the best? But it was different technologies, right? That you right. would hope would all integrate together. Now there's obviously this big, much more of a push for all in platform. So like Orion adding all these various components. So you stay within their, almost like Apple, you know, you stay within their ecosystem. Right. Right. And in advise on now, it's like they were early, but it seems like now they're almost ahead in a way that they were sort of like this all in with their CRM, even in there and things like that. And I guess going forward, this might be the reality where it's like, forget about trying to integrate everything. Let's just build like an all in platform that we can take just do it all. Yeah. I think there's probably two or three effects that are happening at the same time. You know, one, one is there is kind of this pendulum swing that happens in the industry where like if you go back 20 plus years ago all the all the technology was proprietary. It just the the biggest firms that had the biggest budgets had the best technology because they could hire technology teams to build it. It's so like good tech was basically in wirehouses and big bank and trust companies and independents had, had nothing. Then some tech started getting built for independence, which made a few people go more independent because you know there's more tech to support independence. Then the more independence brought more tech companies because the market was bigger. And then more tech companies brought more independence because there were more solutions. And then more right. independence brought more tech companies because there were a lot more independence. And and like we went through this cycle and built more and more to the point that you know, we I mean we started making the advisor tech map a couple of years ago 
just to literally help navigate all of the choices. Now, I mean, we still do it for that reason, but I know there are there are companies and platforms that use that map as like the butt end of a joke of like, <laughs> here's how here's how crazy bonkers it's gotten out there. And I think a lot of us advisors feel at the visceral level, just, you know, granted folks like you are fantastic and that you go pioneer out there, you live a little bit on that bleeding edge, you like beta testing and trying it out. I think a lot of advisors are not necessarily there. It's just this overwhelming number of choices and even more frustrating because not everything integrates with everything else. And it's hard to even figure out what integrates with everything else. And everybody says they quote integrate with everybody else, but sometimes those aren't really actually very deep and meaningful integrations. And so I think that has started the pendulum swinging the other direction of, yeah, you know, it would really be cool if one platform that just did all of those things where I didn't have to patch all of them together with my hands or you know, using Zapier or whatever it is that we got to do right. to, to force these integrations or just, you know, to, so we don't have to keep begging the companies like we use this and this other and this other software. And, you know, we found seven other people who do as well. If the eight of us send you an email all at the same time, will you please make this integration? And And so much of that is kind of a frustrating bubble up from from advisors just begging integrations to be built. So I I think the pendulum is mm-hmm. swinging the other way because just we hit sort of the logical extreme on how many different best of breeds you can patch together. Now the pendulum's going the other way because there I think there is more willingness for firms to say, all right, maybe it won't all be the, per, the best of breed, but it's going to be pretty good and I don't have to be the integrator engineer anymore. And you know that'll run for some number of years and then it'll be to all in one e and not right, enough innovation, right. and then and then the pendulum will swing the other way again because that's how pendulums. Yeah, I mean, look at politics for having sixty. But no, it, and it's interesting because part of our review is like, all right, well, what softwares for us are you know like a non negotiable? They're not not going anywhere, right? Like e money. So part of that conversation is like, which technologies out there integrate with e money? I mean, that's why we love Orion because of that yep. deep integration, and that's why it's so hard to leave Orion because of that deep integration. Yep. And it makes a big difference, you know? Yeah, I, I, I kind of call this the the balkanization of the advisor tech world that, you know, certain platforms became really big hubs that everybody else built to. So Orion's kind of built an integration hub, eMoney's built an integration hub, Investnet has a deep integration hub on their end, TD Ameritrade's VO was a big integration hub. So like there, there are these certain platforms that have become particularly significant hubs. And if you get mm-hmm. attached to one of those hubs, you you immediately tend to kind of narrow down the view and really only work with the solutions that that fit into that hub. So new startups try to find their way to hubs and platforms try to become hubs because as you said, like once you're attached to a hub and all the things that that come off that hub, it's really hard to move the hub. It is. No, you're absolutely right. And that's kind of where we are. I mean, but it's like the cool thing too with technology, sometimes it even opens up different avenues. So for example, for the 2020, I guess, tax year, we created a tax filing company. Newbridge Tax Services. And really, we did that because of Holista Plan. So Holista Plan, and I remember talking to you know Ben and Roger when I got back from a T3 conference on their mm-hmm. podcast. And I'm like, you guys, you know, you're awesome. You talk taxes, which is my favorite discipline of all the financial planning disciplines. So you do all this, it's awesome. And they're like, yeah, we got this thing, you know, this new tech. I'm like, well, I got to do it. Let me see it. And I'm like, all right, this is awesome. And then sort of like what it was allowing me to do is like, you know what? This is giving me enough confidence to sort of start my own tax practice. And right now it's basically- Interesting. So, and so you have now built a, a tax practice for clients leveraging Holista Plan. Correct. That's absolutely correct. We actually, we partnered up with a local EA. She's absolutely fantastic. And right now it's just for our own existing clients. But there was, there was- it was like over a period of two to three years, we had so many individuals come to us, oh, we're looking for a new accountant, or our prior accountant failed to file two years of 8606s. You know, they're just not, they're not up to date on the new tax laws when I'm sending out a newsletter every two, two weeks about taxes. Right. And it's like, and I'm like, look, you know, and so I sent out a survey. I'm like, how much interest is there, you know, from our clientele? And it was like a third of the clients were like, yeah, we, we'd sign on next year. You know, as soon as you have it, we, and Michael, I got to tell you now, just think about the data and the information that you now have at your fingertips with them uploading everything. You know, we're basically service the front of the house. We have a shared platform with the accountant. They're the ones that actually, you know, put their name on it when they file their taxes. But that, now I have all this information available. I have their W-2s. I mean, it's just, mm-hmm. it's fantastic and it allows us to be so much more proactive. But yeah, because of technology, it allows us to sort of push out this entirely different service model. 
So it's good. So Vince, tell us a little bit more just about your advisory firm itself. I mean, we've talked a, talked a lot about all the, the wonderful tech toys, but talk to us a little bit about the, the advisory firm itself. Yeah. So, well, really, it all kind of started at Vanguard. When I was at Vanguard, there was an asset management department there, and which no longer exists. It's now like the financial planning thing that they have. We were providing advice to clients, you know, high net worth. It was very similar to what we do do now. And I absolutely loved it. I mean, it was absolutely fantastic. And the issue that I did have, though, is Vanguard would always stop you whenever that you were providing advice on something that they did not have and did they sell. For example, you know, the estate advice that we were, you know, provide was limited. We weren't able to really talk about cash flow, taxes, things like those lines. And I'm like, but that's the interesting stuff. I can't even talk about what's interesting. La- you know, it sort of forced me to say, all right, what else is out there? So you actually started your career like at Vanguard, not just yeah. using Vanguard funds, like literally worked at Vanguard. Yeah, I was a crew member. And I was, it was, it was actually Bogle had just hung it up. Okay. About a year or two prior and Jack Brennan was in charge. But, you know, Mr. Bogle was still present. Like I had lunch with him in the galleys. My wife actually was running one of the galleys at, at Vanguard. Very cool. Yeah, it was just, it was a really cool environment. I love my time there. But with any big corporate entity, right, constantly we're hitting these walls. It's like, well, I want to be able to talk to my clients about what they want to talk about. And I can't do that. And then it was, became meetings upon meetings. I'm like, I'm out. I can't do this. My soul is being compromised. I got to get out of here. So I actually took my time at that point in time to figure out the landscape of financial services, right? Because even when you were at Vanguard, at that time, they have since opened their doors, but you weren't really able to get involved in the Financial Planning Association. I, I joined a fee-based firm out in Radnor, and it was similar to what you were talking about with Pinnacle, 200 million in, in double-digit employees. Help me understand that a little bit more, just the, the leap out of Vanguard, particularly if you you didn't actually have a lot of other experience and familiarity outside of that world because you, you hadn't been involved in in membership associations and the like. Like just yeah. how did you decide to make the leap? How did you get comfortable like you know, going from a lar- a wonderfully large safe firm into the you know virtual pioneering wilderness? Like yeah, just, how does that come to fruition in practice? Yeah, because that was in it was in 07. Okay. So I was at Vanguard like five, six years. And it was about sort of reaching out to a lot of people. And it started with, because I, I didn't know what an RIA was at that point in time, fee-based, fee, you know, that stuff didn't, I don't know what that was. So it actually started with a conversation I had with somebody, a principal, right, who was a friend of my uncle's, because I just wanted to understand what else is out there. Because before Vanguard, I was in advertising for two years, you know, I was a psych major. So I, I didn't quite know much about this world at all. I just loved math and people. So it's like, but is there somewhere else out there that I can have more in-depth conversations with individuals and really make a difference. And so this guy, principal, he turned me on to a bigger RIA at the time. So I just started talking to a lot of people and trying to understand what the landscape looked like, what these firms were, what they did, what they didn't do. And that's when I found this, this firm in Radnor, TGS. And uh, they were actually looking for somebody because they were mostly an investment shop, right? And they were looking for somebody with Vanguard process experience, you know, Six Sigma. Remember that? Yep. Is that even still used anymore? I think it's still out there. All right. They brought me on to help sort of create this financial planning department. And the first thing I did was, all right, what industry organizations are out there, right? Okay. And, and I happened on FPA, the first conference I ever went to. Now, this is a very long answer to your short question, but was actually business solutions. Remember that? Oh, yes, absolutely. Yes. Yes. It was doing its own like practice management plus tech conference back in the mid 2000s. Right. And it was like, wow. And coming from sort of the closed network of Vanguard, it was like, this is this is interesting. And that's where I met. Uh, I know I'm going to mispronounce his last name, but Dwight Chiklis. Michaelis. Thank yes. you. And he was beyond awesome. He actually then he introduced me to you. And then that's how I found FPA yeah. Next Gen. And FPA Next Gen was instrumental. So, you know, if there are people listening to this, if you have an opportunity to get involved, I hope Next Gen is, I mean, this was like Jude Boudreaux. I mean, these were the glory days of Next Gen, man, you know, but it was incredible to be involved at that level. And I learned so much about everything. And it really put me in a position to say, all right, in a few years, I know I want to do this myself. So you knew pretty early on that this was going to be your end point. 
Yes. And even part of that due diligence, that process was doing road trips. We saw like three or four different firms and just to understand how RIAs did things, specifically with the planning, because mind you, the firm that I was with didn't have a very robust planning. Right? right. So it's like, they all right. still trying to figure that out. Exactly. So it's like, what is this going to look like when I go on my own? What do I need to do? This and that. And then it was finally really, I mean, there was a lot of internal things that I won't go into, but I think maybe financial services is the worst when it comes to tech. The only person, the only industry that might be worse is healthcare. Hmm. But there was finally some things happening. It's, it was actually around portfolio management because we were using Advent Access, right? Right. And there was other things coming out. That were just really cool. I think Black Diamond was something at that point in time that I was falling in love with. Yeah. And I'm like, you know what? I can leverage a lot of this tech and not have to hire anybody. Right. I mean, because at that point in time, my wife was just getting started in real estate. We just had our third child. So it was very scary. And then I was introduced via FPA. I was introduced to this other guy. He was a CFA. And I'm like, this is great. And then I can focus on financial planning and the relationships. I mean, this is this is like a dream come true. And he he had good stock, you know, it came from good people. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, uh, and then we did it. We absolutely did it. And it was I actually though, which was unique, I was given the opportunity because I asked for it to buy out my existing book of business. Right. Now keep in mind, you know, work for an RIA, just like you're working for the big RTDs and you kind of come through the ground level. At that point in time, you're not one of your responsibilities is not business development so much, right? It's serving the existing book of business. So 98% of the clients I was working with at the time were given to me. So I'm Which still- Which creates and, the whole awkward, like I've got the relationship with them and I put all the time into them and I built with them, but I didn't bring them in. It was the firm's client. They quote unquote assigned it to me. So what do we do? What do we do if you're leaving? Right, exactly. So we, we, we did negotiate actually a price and it was two times trailing 12 months. Okay. 100% seller financed. I think Live Oak Bank came about maybe a year or two later. So there wasn't many funding mechanisms for you know young RIAs at that point. I mean, I knew I was going to be clearing with TD, and th- they didn't have anybody to really offer. So it was like, all right, I paid a little bit more, 100% seller financed, you know. But I was so, able to stake Newbridge with about like I guess yeah, 12, 13 million. Interesting. So just that was sort of the the compromise, right? From from there on, they may say, well, we, we'd really actually rather keep these clients and not and not sell them off. But if we say we're going to keep them, then there's a risk that some of them are going to follow to Vince. You can sit there and say, well, some of these clients are probably following me anyways. It would really suck to pay for the clients that were going to come <laughs> with me anyways. But I run the risk that they're not going to come with me and this gets messy. So there's, there's sort of a like both sides have something to lose by cutting a deal, which is, which is how you often get to a really good deal. That's absolutely correct. That's absolutely correct. And I mean, uh, obviously, I was under a non-solicit, non-compete. You know, a two year, and I didn't want to mess with that. I wanted to maintain a good relationship with the firm and things like that. You know, it was funny. My attorney a couple of times said, "You know what, Vince? Let's just go to the courts because it was taking a while. It took ninety days to draw up the the uh, documents, and I was approved within thirty by the mm-hmm. state. So there was a disconnect there, and you know, and obviously being out of touch with your clients as they're being assigned to new people kind of yeah. hurts. You know, hurts a little bit. But no, and then but from that point, I mean, it's been. It was the greatest decision of my entire life. Greatest decision. The only thing is, I would caution like some sometimes young advisors. So I was spending so much of my time servicing those clients that had come with me. And I had u- been using a lot of the tools that I had gained from the other firm to provide that advice. because so I wanted to make it seamless. The right. issue though is, Michael, is I didn't spend the necessary time in creating new bridge, like from the ground up. I didn't spend enough time at that point in time defining who my ideal client was, defining who my niche was, defining my back office, right. sort of putting things in place. It was much more reactive than proactive. And now I'm finding myself over the last couple of years having to create that. You know what I mean? And I've, I've been able to get enough, obviously, new clients to be able to help define my ideal client. But all types of different people came to me from the other firm. You know, there wasn't like one specific subset of clients that I could, I could create sort of a niche out of. Right. But that's the only thing is like take that time in the beginning to sort of create your process, create your mission statement, create who you are. Because it felt like I was just running to make sure that these clients were happy because I was so concerned of losing them because it was like, you know, our primary, our primary income coming into our household at the time. Right. But from that point forward, then, you know, the technology just got better. The conversations with individuals just got better and it's been a great experience. But but like, and the other thing too is real quick is 
what I did learn at my old firm. So are you familiar with Strategic Coach? Yep, absolutely. So, so that's where I fell in love with Canada, mind you. So I would go to Toronto every quarter. And, you know, I spent a couple of days up there, just like hardcore strategic coach. And it was absolutely fantastic. And it really allowed me to sort of look at my days differently where it's like, okay, you know, you got buffer days, you got free days and you got focus days. Right. And the buffer days are the days that you're working on the business, you know, creating workflows, doing all that great stuff, doing all sort of, and then you have your focus days where it's more business development, client activities. You know, those are Tuesdays and Thursdays, Monday and Wednesdays are my buffer. And then Friday becomes my free. And if I need to meet with clients that day, I can, or, you know, I take the kids and we hit the, uh, we hit the Jersey shore, right? What have you, but, but you have to earn that Jersey shore time, mind you. But so that really allowed, gave me, you know, allowed me to sort of create my days and create my year. And it helped, it helped big time, helped me sort of think about things. And also what it also allowed me to do is like, all right, what are my, you know, core competencies? What are the things that I enjoy doing a lot that I'm really good at? Let's focus on those and everything else, outsource, get rid of it. So that's how I found Michelle from Nifty, who's been absolutely insanely awesome. How I've sort of, you know, outsourced all my marketing, all that kind of stuff. It's like, let me just do the financial planning and the relationships and the, well, and the tech, of course, got to include the tech. So, so Nifty does outsource virtual assistant work, they like do. operations work for you? They do. They do all my operations. They communicate, you know, helping me with scheduling. They also do some marketing, you know, pushing out content and things along those lines. If I get stuck on something or something needs to happen, you know, it's like, hey, Michelle, can you handle this? You know, so it's been it's been great. And so then talk to us about the clientele. Like who who do you serve? How many clients are are under the firm? Yeah. So we have about probably about 70 clients. So the structure is, uh, you know, there's myself, there's my partner, you know, Chris Wiegan. We really work on relationships together, right? We don't necessarily have he's mine. There, the only situation might be retainer clients, where you know they have their assets at Vanguard or something like that, and we provide financial planning annually. Obviously, I'm much more involved in those types of relationships, right? But otherwise, we really work with clients together. We have another individual who's actually an, an estate attorney, but he's also a CFP. So for a lot and of is estate, he an advisor or? Like, what is he doing? Is he is an advisor and he'll probably be, he's, he's an older gentleman. So we're actually, we have a, um, you know, agreement in place to purchase out his, uh, his clientele. Okay. But he's, so he's slowly, slowly introducing them to us. So he'll probably be with us another few years, okay. uh, but it's great at least now having that estate. So even if our clients need estate work done, we just call Tom and we bring Tom into the process and then we get the estate work done at a fraction of the cost very similar to sort of the accounting work. And uh, so it's really, you know, the three of us on staff. And, we've and got it's literally clients. just the three of you on staff. There's no one else. No. And then we outsource everything else. So uh, truly everything, I mean, just three advisors and everything else is outsourced. Correct. And well, I guess outsourced in tech. And, and it and it sounds like functionally all the outsourcing is just nifty for all of your operations related support or is there another outsourcing provider that does some some stuff as well yeah i mean we have another outs you know for for additional marketing much more detailed marketing that's that's where we use seven so we do have that i mean my old firm we had two marketing people you know two specific marketing people that basically that seven and michelle are now doing for me so maybe not maybe a little bit differently but so yeah, just a lot of that. And obviously then when you even look at technology, if you want to consider Orion doing the daily reconciliation, that's sort of like outsourcing when I think about, because I'm always comparing it to the prior firm. Right. And then where we had two heads that did that as well, to me, that's outsourcing that. So we don't need, but we are getting to the point that we are going to need to consider a power planner to sort of help with, with that, that part of the, uh, the firm. Okay. Yeah. But otherwise, but yeah, like 75 clients. What's the asset base for you? About 120. Okay. Yeah. So it's, uh, it works well. And, you know, we're starting to see, obviously when we first started, it was much more AUM. Now the individuals you speak to, it becomes, you know, more of a, a re- sometimes a retainer type relationship. So that and, was a little bit different. And just who's the clientele? Like, who do you, who do you guys serve? Who do you go after at the end of the day? Yeah, we go after, you know, families with complex issues, you know, with, it's usually, like I said, 45 to 55, and they're, they're at a point in their life where they've, they've been working 20, 25 years, really doing the same thing in the corporate world. It's mostly corporate guys or girls, right? 
they're faced with burnout, man. They're just faced with like, is this what I want to continue doing? You know, they're working just to maintain their household, but they don't really have any freedom. They don't have much choice. They've just been sort of trying to do the right thing, saving for college, saving for retirement, this and that. But it's so cloudy, they can't sort of see through it and says, all right, well, what do I want for the next 30, 40 years of my life? Do I want to continue doing this? You know, a lot of stock options that they might have. Like I said, it's a lot of corporate execs and they've been driving, you know, it actually reminds me when I was at Vanguard, all I wanted to do was be a manager. You know, I wanted that level E salary, you know, become a manager, this and that. You were driven for that. These individuals driven for maybe VP, maybe managing director, but they really look at the VP when that's been their focus. And now they get a little bit older, 45, 50, maybe they haven't quite hit that VP. You know, it's like, is this something that I want to continue, you know, pushing for, do I want to add a little bit more balance to my life? But if I'm adding a little bit more balance to my life, how the heck am I going to do that? You know? So that's where I can really bring in my psychology to say, all right, you know, what do you want? You know, what is your mission statement? You know, if you were to lose your job today, how would you feel? You know, if you had, if you could choose anything to do in your life, because a lot of these individuals we work with, they've done well for themselves. They've made a lot of smart decisions in the past. You know, they've done good things. Their parents have taught them well to, to start saving at an early age. You know, it's not necessarily where we're breaking bad habits. It's just ensuring that they can really add some real value and worth to their life. And they need some help in doing that. And that's sort of where we step in. So it's fascinating. So the conversations that we have are, are, I'm learning a lot about sort of the future my kids are stepping into because of their own kids being in college. Yeah. So it's, 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 it's fascinating. So what surprised you the most about building an advisory business? It's always more work than you think it is. I don't know if you remember, but the first two years, it was sort of like, you know, oh, I own my own RIA. I own my RIA. Nowadays, that's not even important really anymore. It's just like, all right, I just need, I want to be able to provide good value to my clients, right? And sometimes you just get in your own way because what you think is important is not necessarily what's important to the end user. So just trying to always capture their feedback and really a lot of what you want to do, right? But the most challenging thing is it's very easy to sort of rest, sit back, especially when you attain a certain like income or asset Mm -hmm. level right? And then you make this decision like, all right, do I want to maintain a lifestyle practice or do I want to continue to grow at a decent clip? It's those types of thoughts and decisions that are quite challenging. You know, it's like, do I have, do I have enough even as a firm here? You know, do I need to continue to, to push it and push it? And the challenge is always kind of staying ahead of the curve because if you rest, if you sit back for like six months, you know, somebody's going to pass you. Right. Somebody's going to be providing a better client experience. So that's probably the most challenging thing is just constantly staying ahead of the curve. And you, you just really can't let yourself rest. And then if you do let yourself rest and you're resting too much, that's where you need those conversations. Like, well, is this something where it is just a lifestyle practice and I'll own that? Because I remember when I really, when we first started Newbridge, you know, when I was actually inspired talking to, you know, John at Pinnacle. It's like, all right, well, I want to be a billion dollar firm. How long is it going to take me to hit billion dollars? You know, what's it going to take? Mm -hmm. Michael, now, you know, what's it been? Six years, seven years? That's not important to me anymore, man. It's really not. Because then I got to hire a bunch of people, Uh right? I got to manage those people. I've had some experience in managing and I, and I realize I'm not a great manager because I have no patience and I demand you do it my way. (laughs) So it doesn't work well. So is that, is that something that I want or do I, I want to just provide a kick-ass experience for the current clients that I have and kind of curb a little bit of growth, you know, and keep it sort of manageable, but just, and that's where I am right now. You know, as you, as you sort of age and mature, it's not about go, go, go. It's like, let me just do what I'm doing and let me do an excellent job at it. That billion dollar mark isn't, isn't as important as it once was just because of everything that comes, comes with it. And I think, COVID helped me realize that a little bit because the time that I spent with my three boys, you know, Michael, I think, you know, we're luckier than we were than even our parents. Now, you know, it's horrible COVID happened, of course, but the benefit is I got to know my kids, even my wife, at such a deeper level. I mean, you're Mm -hmm. stuck, you know, and it was an incredible experience. And it's like, I don't want that to end, you know, and it's like, maybe when they hit puberty, it'll be a different story because it's, you know, they're going to hate me and I'm, they're going to annoy, you know, they're going to annoy me. 
But right now, just spending that time with them has been absolutely fantastic. And just like, all right, maybe I do take my foot off the gas a little bit. And that's okay. That's okay. So what was the low point for you? The low point was actually probably losing my first client that came with me. Ooh. Yeah. So what happened? That was tough. And that was a smack. And, you know, it was, it was really about sort of the experience, the client experience and the service. And it was a point where talk about resting on your laurels a little bit and just sort of letting, all right, you know, the machine will just do what the machine does without much input from me. And they felt that they weren't getting the attention or the service. And it made me sit back and look at everything. And it's real. And you know what? You're right. I'm not, I don't deserve you as a client. You know, I'm not providing you what is necessary. And it sort of forced me to look at the client experience, what I've been doing the last year and a half to say, okay, what can I do to ensure that I'm providing quality advice to my clients and they're getting it when they need to get it. And they're not waiting to hear from me when important things are happening. I was shaken up by that, you know, and uh, it took me a while to get over it. And part of it sounds like ties to your systems and process and technology were tied in really well. In fact, it was making the business very efficient, but the problem was that made it too easy to get complacent about the more proactive communication or outreach. And, and that's ultimately what the, what the client decided to take action on. It's absolutely correct. It's absolutely correct. You know, yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't providing them what they were paying for. And it was, it got to the point where it was like, yeah, it's like, you know, what you were saying, it's like, you know, things are being delivered. It's efficient, this and that, but they're not getting that heart. They're not getting that human relationship. And that's what they want. And, and if they really wanted tech, they could buy it off the internet without you anyways, if they only wanted the tech. That's absolutely correct. So it's like, all right, well, then I got to, yeah, thinking that the e-money e portal was enough. Well, it's delivering everything you need. No, it's not, Vince. Come on, what are you doing? So what else do you, like, do you know now that you wish you could go back and tell you from eight eight years ago when you were getting ready to, to take the leap and, and launch Newbridge? It's a couple of things. Number one, would spend the time sort of building it a little bit more proactively and a little bit more intentional. In what context, like of... of going out and, and like getting clients and trying to grow it faster or the, the actual structure of the business and the offer or, or something else, which, which now, parts? Yeah, actually the structure of the business itself, it was, because what I think you're doing really well with XY, you know, you're pushing, pushing niche, you're pushing sort of, all right, look at the business, you know, and, and for me, I didn't spend that time in really defining who we were as a firm. Right. And using that as sort of our North Star to say, based on that and who we want to be and who we're serving, this is the firm that we want to we want we want to be. We didn't do that from the beginning. And it felt like then we were always trying to chase who we were and what we and what kind of services that we were providing. It was almost like we were a generalist, we'll just take everything. And as a result, we were spreading ourselves too thin. It was too much. It was too much. The other thing too is I would rather I wish I had more conversations with my wife in the early part of the process. Because no matter how much you think they know about what we do, they don't, right? They don't really understand. It's like, all right, this is sort of what my career is. This is how my days are going to be defined. It's not eight to five. You know, when I was working at my old firm, it was. You know, I showed up at 830. Right. You know, I would work late with client meetings, but it was still within that sort of, here it's not. It's all over the place. And sometimes it's weekends, everything like that. And it really, at least initially for the first few years, really added some significant stress. Mm -hmm. That if I was a better communicator with my wife, it wouldn't have been that bad. So really, but I, again, you, because it was an expectations issue of just hadn't communicated what it was going to entail in the first place. And so if you'd had the communication, you feel like it would have gone better. But because you hadn't, there was a lot of expectations that were turning out different than reality. That's right. That's right. And when you start moving into that resentment, which we didn't, thank God, but you know, if you go into that resentment, you know, next step sometimes is separation, divorce, right? right. So it's like, all right, I got to, we got to sort of stop short of that resentment period. But we have now created a process where it's like, if I have client meetings, it's only Tuesday nights. Right. Yeah. And things along those lines, again, just putting those things in place to say, all right, so it allows freedom for both of us. But that would be the big thing. Just ongoing communication with your spouse as to what it takes, because there's always things that are going to happen that you're not quite prepared for. You know what I mean? There's always something there. We were actually, was it this year? 
yeah, we were audited earlier this year. And it was funny, we're preparing to go SEC, right? And then we get audited by the state. No. I think it's I think it's almost as though they knew that somehow. Yes, they saw the number. And well, they're like, we're right, leaving. Let's let's visit for a moment before you leave, shall we? Yeah. Yeah. I think we, we made out all right because it was during COVID. So everything was virtual. Right. And my business partner, yeah, he's the chief compliance officer. So my responsibility was just helping sort of, you know, get the gather the docs. But uh, but otherwise, yeah, it was like two Zoom calls, and then it was uh, then it was done, you know, which was which was nice. But that's yeah, you, you can tell all your people that at least in the state of Pennsylvania, it's not it's not horrible. So, so don't be intimidated by the <laughs> by the audit process. So, what advice would you give younger, newer advisors looking to to start their careers today and want to want to get off on a good foot? You have to work your ass off, and you have to earn it. You know, you can't. You know, expect to work, be working 60, 70 hour, you know, it, and sometimes it's, it, you know, I'm, I'm hesitant to say an, an hour because it's really, I mean, a lot of times you can be efficient and work less than that, but, but you got to put the time in and you got to work on the technical. You got to stay, you know, you got to be able to write financial plans. You got to have a, a technical knowledge of everything. You got to just be able to run a business, have a business owner mentality. You know, sometimes what I see is these individuals will, will jump in especially maybe if they haven't had enough experience and the advice they're providing and things like that are just, they're not seasoned enough. So it's like, maybe it's not a horrible idea to get a little bit more seasoned before you jump into starting your own RIA. I mean, clients just aren't going to be knocking on your door. You know, it's like the most difficult part, you know, is sometimes the business development. You know, that's, it's very challenging. NAFA was a big help in the beginning. And I don't know if it's the change of the algorithm that they're not as helpful, mm-hmm. at least with providing the referrals to the website. And I'm sure you've heard things about that, but business development, I mean, it's no joke. It's, it's hard. You have to pound that so, payment to get those clients. So where would you tell, you know, the, the, the newer advisor to start first in, in tackling next? That's a, it's a lot of stuff to learn and absorb. So where do you, where do you start or what do you focus on first? The first thing that I did was I did a 10 mile radius. I just took it from the office 10 miles around and I tried to get to know a lot of accountants, attorneys within those 10 miles, knowing that maybe 5% would be an active referral base, but sometimes it's not them. Sometimes it's a friend of theirs, right? But Mm -hmm. just getting to know everybody in that particular network and learning as much as you possibly can. Like to me, the FPA, even when I first started Newbridge, was instrumental in, in assisting you know, and, and maybe it's study groups, things like that. You just want to be able to sharpen your skills as a business owner, because as you, you know, have more experience, you're able to make better decisions and those decisions can be much quicker, but it's very, very important that you learn as much as you possibly can, you know, get off the bloody internet and and go meet some people, you know, talk to people. So as we wrap up really already, yeah, time flies. Mm-hmm. As we wrap up, this is a podcast about success. And and one of the themes always just the, the word success means different things to different people. And so as someone who's built a, a successful business, as you said, kind of getting to a point where you're feeling really good about the the business and a place where you don't have to keep your foot on the gas as hard. So the, the business is doing well. How do you define success for yourself at this yeah, point? It's a, it's a great question. Because if you asked me the same question five years ago, it'd obviously be a different answer. Mm. Because at that point, success was all defined about the growth of the company and making it as big as it possibly can. How I define success now is the ability of you know the business to create a business that allows me to do two things. Number one, you know, make the end user very, very satisfied and happy. But number two, allows me to be a present father. Mm-hmm. You know, with a lot of the individuals, even that we work with, part of what we try to do and tell them is like, let us remove things. So you can have more time with your family unit. It's all about spending, you know, is that work life is like, you don't necessarily want to give up things, but it's, but to me, success is just being, is really a, is being a present father and creating a business that allows me to do that. I love the focus. I love the focus. Well, thank you, Vince, so much for joining us on the financial advisor success podcast. Thank you, Mike. It was fantastic. Hopefully I didn't ramble too much. It was was fantastic. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Michael.
Want even more ideas, tools, and resources on how to break through to the next level of success as a financial advisor? Check out the leading financial planning industry blog, Nerd's Eye View, at www.kitsis.com, where Michael covers the latest practice management trends and financial planning strategies. And by joining the members section, you can earn IMCA and CFP continuing education credits, along with exclusive member content. Get it all now at www.kitsis.com.